Trump Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 81, recorded on September 8th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we're going to talk about Paul's latest column called To Serve Man. Now, Paul, just bear with me for a minute. Before we get to the column, so many things have been happening. I want to ask you about them. What did you think about RFK Jr.'s appearance before the Finance Committee of the Senate last week? What was encouraging about that for me is that I thought Cassidy... Senator Cassidy from Louisiana held him to account to some extent. I thought he could have been more uh, active than he was, but that was good. And then uh, uh, Senator Barrasso from uh, Wyoming also held him to account, as did Senator Tillis from North Carolina. So you had three Republican senators that were expressing ex pretty extreme displeasure for his point of view. The other thing that struck me is never at any time during that committee hearing did RFK Jr. ever say anything positive about vaccines. He didn't. And when asked the question, don't you think it's it's uh, contradictory that on the one hand you say you're not anti-vaccine and then on the other hand say that there's no vaccine that's safe and effective? He said, no, that's not contradictory. Last time you were before Congress, Secretary Kennedy, you claimed, and I quote, I have never been anti-vax. I have never told the public to avoid a vaccination. But in a podcast, you said the opposite. You said there's no vaccine that is safe and effective. So that sure sounds anti-vax to me, Secretary Kennedy. So let me ask you, when were you lying, sir? When you told this committee that you were not anti-vax or when you told Americans that there's no safe and effective vaccine? Uh, both things are true. He's increasingly boxing him into a corner. I think these Republican senators are feeling it from their constituents who are writing them. That's the only reason that they would do that. I think you're right. I think they're the wetted finger to the wind, and they're getting a sense, uh, in accordance with that recent poll that was conducted by a Trump-friendly polling organization, that if you set the COVID vaccine aside, that more than 80% of people, Republican or Democrat, support vaccines, and even support vaccine requirements for school entry. So I think that um, maybe the tide's turning here. That would be great, because it needs to turn. I, I really was interested in what Trump said last week, let me, let me quote this. He said, look, you have some vaccines that are so amazing. The polio vaccine, I happen to think, is amazing, he told reporters in the Oval Office. You have to be very careful when you say that some people don't have to be vaccinated. It's a very tough position, end quote. That's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it's interestingly the second time he's mentioned the polio vaccine. He, he right. There's a uh, sort of RFK Jr.'s right-hand man, a man named Aaron Siri, um, has a while ago sort of submitted a petition to the FDA saying that, that the inactivated polio vaccine, IPOL, needs to be tested, tested in a prospective placebo-controlled trial, which is not going to happen. But um, our, uh, uh, Trump immediately responded to that. He said, no, don't touch that vaccine because yep. – Trump is a child of the 40s. He was born in 1944. So he certainly remembers polio, as I remember polio, as a child be, being born in 1951. And that is a very, very emotional disease. Well, interesting times. Let's get to your column. In this column, you say you're interested, you're trying to understand the recent inexplicable actions of our HHS head. What were you thinking about there? Well, so I remember saying once to uh, to my wife, um, this is like a bad Twilight Zone episode. And you know, I was born in 1951. Twilight Zone was, I think, on between 57 and, and 62. But I was very much impressed by Twilight Zone because it was always this sort of zinger ending, this really surprising ending. And and when I said that, so I started to think, you know, is there any specific Twilight Zone episode that it reminds me of? And it's this one, the one called To Serve Man. I love Twilight Zone also. I thought Rod Serling was just brilliant. Yes. And uh, I, what's, what is the premise of To Serve Man, which I think aired in the 60s, in the early 60s, right? Right, aired in 1962. Um, based on a short story that actually ended up being a by Damon Knight, I think, ended up winning a short story prize like in 2001. I mean, written in 1950, you know, wins a wins mm. uh, prize for short stories 50 years later. But in any case, the, the premise is, is that um, aliens come to Earth, 
They're nine feet tall. They have these mechanical voices. And the first thing they do is they appear, appear in front of Congress and they say <laughs> that they promise all these things. They promise that, you know, the, the agriculture will be fertile, that there'll be the end of war, that they can clean up the environment, that it's just going to be great. And they give them a book called, to, which they're able to crack the code as to serve man. And so they thought, great, here are these aliens coming in to serve man. And then um, the sort of hideous catch is that, as it turns out, as they all start to get on um, the spaceship to go back to uh, the planet of these aliens, uh, they realize, but not until it's too late, that To Serve Man was actually a cookbook, and they were just fattening people up so they could, <laughs> once they got back to their planet. I, I always loved, you know, Rod Serling would appear before each episode for a minute or two and give a little monologue, and it was almost the best part. And here's the one for this one. I have to read it, okay? Respectfully submitted for your perusal, a Kanamit, height a little over nine feet, weight in the neighborhood of 350 pounds, origin unknown, motives, therein hangs the tale. For in just a moment, we're going to ask you to shake hands figuratively with a Christopher Columbus from another galaxy and another time. This is the Twilight Zone. <laughs> That's great, Vincent. <laughs> That's great that you put that in. Now, I mean, I loved when he used to say, this is the Twilight Zone. And it was black and white. That was the thing. It was just so spooky being in black and white. Now, the first thing I thought of when reading your column is, if, these, if any aliens came to Earth, they would be immediately quarantined, of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> because who knows what kind of microbes they they carried with them. But of course, this is science fiction, so we have to let uh, another, uh, much of our sensibilities go free. So how, how does the, <laughs> To Serve Man remind you of RFK Jr. and, and Maha? Well, so Maha also makes similar promises to, to, you know, make us so we have environmental friendly agriculture, that we have better foods, that we have um, a cleaner environment, and that we will, as a consequence, then live longer and live chronic disease free. That's sort of this magical um, promise. But here, too, you have sort of a grotesque catch, which is that while he's presumably doing something related to that, what he's really doing is he's making vaccines less available, less affordable and more feared. And as a consequence, there's been an erosion in vaccine rates. And we're seeing you know, measles epidemic we haven't seen in 33 years. We see 266 children die of influenza, which we haven't seen since 2009. We've had 10 pertussis deaths, whereas we had two pertussis deaths last year. So it's like, so that's the price. That's the grotesque catch. You sort of buy into this Maha movement while at the same time being uh, putting your children in harm's way. So you write that the aliens were easy to spot, <laughs> but RFK Jr. looks like us, although he is different, right? He still looks like us, sounds like us. I mean, he talks like us. So you would assume he's, you know, he's, he's us. But um, he, he possesses certain beliefs that make you feel that he can't really possibly be one of us. He doesn't believe in the germ theory. Um, he doesn't believe HIV caused AIDS. He believes the polio vaccine killed many, many more people than it saved. Um, he believes that the measles virus, natural measles virus, prevents cancer prevents heart disease, you know, prevents autoimmune disease. So he's a, a series of false beliefs that he can, for example, swim in a bacteria infested creek with him and his sort of younger cousins, and that that's all fine, that he can drink raw milk and not worry about things the rest of us are worried about, like Campylobacter or Listeria or Salmonella or E. coli. Um, so like, it's, it's like he's sort of from another planet, really. And that, that's really the only explanation. And then you mentioned it earlier. I mean, these were called the Canimate. He, the the, the uh, aliens were called Canimate. So it begins with a K, has the same <laughs> letters, same number of syllables as Kennedy. I just think this is more than coincidence. <laughs> I, I'm sure you heard also that his... His family members, not his, not his wife, but other family members have asked for him to resign as well. Right. And including recently. I mean, they've really, um, are, they're really upset by this because they know him. They know who he is. And Caroline Kennedy early on, his first cousin, you know, John F. Kennedy's daughter said he's, um, he's a predator. And she also said that his, his, uh, his uncle, John F. Kennedy, and his father, Robert F. Kennedy, would be disgusted by what he's doing. She said that early on, mm. and I think um, we should have paid more attention. You write in your column, 
no one from this planet, or at least no one who has lived here within the past 150 years, could possibly believe these things to be true. Right. See that in poker, it's called the tell. When you keep, when you give yourself away, see that gave him away. I mean, the, the way you wrote that is really remarkable. It's true. Of course, there are many uh, anti-vaccine people who subscribe to everything he says, but they're a minority. Most people, for most people, I would say what he is saying is absurd, right? And see, that's a really important point. I mean, for, for ever since 2016, when he founded Children's Health Defense, which receives a lot of money from very wealthy donors, which were able to pay him then hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to represent their point of view. And their point of view is that vaccines are unnecessarily harmful and that therefore they should be pretty much eliminated. And, and that's their point of view. He's a lawyer acting like a personal injury lawyer who's representing his client. Well, they're not paying him any more. I mean, you and I are paying him. He's now Secretary of Health and Human Services, presumably to represent the health of this entire country. But he's still acting like he's a personal injury lawyer acting on behalf of, of virulent anti-vaccine groups, at, at, which do represent a very small percentage of parents. I mean, really less than 5% of parents, I think, have in any way embrace his kind of view. So he's, he's in theory representing or standing up for the health of America, but he's not doing that at all. So if all this is true about him, and he's a modern-day canimit. <laughs> Why is he in a position of power? Why don't lawmakers recognize he's a charlatan, as he was called at the Finance Committee uh, by one senator last week? And, sir, you're a charlatan. That's what you are. Um, privately, they all say that. If you talk to Democrats who are talking to Republican senators or congressmen, they all say that. They say they're, that most people are disgusted with him. But it's a political calculation. They just feel uh, um, that have ambivalent or hesitant to make a call against him in public. But I think they fear him. They fear him for good reason. He's, um, he's just destroyed the public health infrastructure. And that's sort of part of it, too. I think when I was talking about um, to some reporters, I would say things like, I feel like we've been invaded by another planet and that that, that planet's first mission is to destroy public health. And I think that was also sort of came into the why I thought this Twilight Zone episode reminded me of all this. You write that Kennedy's Maha movement might help us eat better and live longer. But aside from banning red dye number three, he hasn't told us of anything else he's doing other than reducing vaccine access. Right. I mean, it's, it's, we hear about like beef tallow versus seed oils. We hear about like additives to ice cream. We hear about converting Coke from having sort of high fructose corn syrup to just having pure cane sugar. I don't see how any of this in any way improves our life. Um, I think you reasonably could say that ultra processed foods are at least part of the problem that we have in this country, which is, is clear, which is obesity um, and the, and the consequences of obesity, like high blood pressure and, and diabetes, which, you know, put one at risk of strokes, heart attacks. So yes, I think that we need to try and do better at it. We, we are heavier than other nations. That's why we had so much of a higher COVID death rate. Obesity was clearly a uh, risk factor for severe COVID. And so we have whatever, 4% of the world's population, but had really closer to 20% of the world's deaths, I think in part because we, we do have that health problem, but I don't see him attacking that health problem at all. I mean, are we supposed to consider Fruit Loops and Coca-Cola now that has pure cane sugar health foods now? So as far as you should be suspicious of Fruit Loops because fruit is spelled F-R-O-O-T. Maybe it's not right. A fruit. Right. There's not much fruit. Well, the obesity rate in the U.S. is huge. I think it's like 60, 70 percent compared to Japan where it's less than 5 percent. So clearly it's a dietary but also other influences as well. And it would be great to go after that, but I haven't seen him say anything about it. He's just obsessed with – vaccines, essentially. Because that's his passion. That is his passion. That has been his passion for 20 years. He believes, truly believes, that with vaccination, we have lessened infectious diseases at the cost of creating chronic diseases. And when he talks about trying to eliminate chronic diseases, what he means by that is he means eliminating vaccines. That's why he can never, ever say anything positive about vaccines. Even at that committee hearing, when he was being asked over and over again to say, don't you think that it's possible that, you know, that the mRNA vaccines or COVID vaccines save lives? He wouldn't say that. The only confusion I express is exactly how many lives were saved. I don't think anybody knows that because of the data chaos. So, it's really unfortunate because they, they saved many, many lives. Many, 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 to paraphrase him. 
That's why you had you didn't have enough manys on your polio vaccine quote from him. You only had two. I think he had four or five or six. Right. So in To Serve Man, when we realized what was happening, it was too late. Is this going to be the same for RFK Jr.'s actions? Right. There, there was a scene at the end when a woman is, is who was, I guess, one of the cryptographers who had was trying to break, break the code. She's, she's running up to the, uh, the spaceship because the person who she served, who was sort of the head cryptographer, was about to get on the spaceship. She said, no, no, it's a cookbook, she screamed. It's a cookbook. Mr. Chambers, don't get on that ship. The rest of the book to serve men, it, it's a cookbook. <laughs> But it was too late. You know, the landing gear took up, <laughs> came up, and then he was he was stuck. And he kept they kept trying to get him to eat because they wanted to fatten him up. And so extending the analogy to RFK Jr., is, is it going to be too late? I think it's already a little late. I mean, when you're seeing the kind of outbreaks we're seeing with measles, pertussis, flu, and you're seeing the CDC report, at least when there still was a CDC, that, you know, we have more uh, parents of kindergartners that are choosing not to vaccinate their children than ever before. And you see people like Joseph Latipo in Florida saying, I'm not going to have vaccine mandates, and I, I'm sure other states will follow. I think this is a terrible cycle. And I just think we haven't hit bottom yet, obviously, because uh, if we had hit bottom, I do think congression, the congressional uh, representatives would stand up in that. That hasn't happened yet. I mean, the Democrats are standing up, but the Republicans, not enough yet. But there was at least some hope in that last finance committee meeting where you did see three Republicans stand up. And hopefully that's the beginning of more to come. Frankly, I never thought the premise of to serve man made, made much sense. This is a pretty expensive meal for these aliens, you know. <laughs> I guess it must be. We must be really good to eat. <laughs> but it's science fiction, so you can break a lot of rules. You can find Paul Offit at Beyond the Noise on Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. 